Well, good morning. Welcome to Worship with Good Samaritan Church in Pinellas Park, Florida on this third Sunday of Advent. I'm Pastor Jen, and as we always say here at Good Samaritan Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, and we really mean it. You are welcome here if you have the holiday blues or the holiday jollies or a little bit of both. You are welcome here if you have a record or no record or a little bit of both. You are welcome here if you are a child or a child that I can't heart, hear or a little bit of both. You are welcome here if you zoom or don't zoom or a little bit of both. And on that note, I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who will join us later in the week on YouTube watching our recorded service. We are grateful for whatever ways you join us for worship and continue to be the church with us. And now I invite you, will you please join me in a song which expresses all the yearning of our hearts this season as we wait for hope, as we wait for peace and joy and love to enter in. Let's sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And now I want to invite everyone to unmute yourselves and we will shout out together the peace of Christ be with you. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Here we go. May the peace of Christ, the peace Christ, Christ be, be with you. you. And also, and also you. with you. Uh, this morning, Roy and Nancy Rudisil are lighting our Advent candles for us. Let's listen. Today we light the candle of joy. Could the whole world be about to turn? Jesus, come with your joy and crawl in beside us, we pray. Now let us be called to worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Edwina Gately uh, and her book, There Was No Path, So I Trod One. God is soaked in our world. God's spirit lives and breathes in and through all that is. We are lost only when we do not understand that God is already with us and in each one of us. Our task is recognition of God's initiative to be at home in us. Acceptance of God with us. Then we cannot but be glad. Will you join me in singing our first uh, song, Canticle of Turning? like to invite Jean Cooley to read our scripture for us this morning. Our first scripture passage comes from Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. Listen now to the word of the prophet. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall rise, raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among all the nations and their offspring among the peoples. 
All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for you have clothed me with righteousness, with a garment of salvation. You have covered me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before the nations. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke during Mary's three-month visit with Elizabeth, chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. Mary said, My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you, my Savior. For you have looked with favor upon your lowly servant. And from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. For you, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. Your mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear you. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in their conceit. You have deposed the mighty from their thrones and raise the lowly to high places. You have filled the hungry with good things while you have sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of Israel, your servant, mindful of your mercy, the promise you made to our ancestors, to Sarah and Abraham and their descendants forever. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jane. Will you all pray with me? God, on this Advent journey of waiting, of remembering and reminding ourselves that you are always coming into our world, that the fullness of you is always being born among us. We listen and we are yearning as ever for your still speaking voice. And so we pray that the words of my mouth, of all of our mouths, and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you. And where we depart from your spirit, O God, may that quickly fall away. Amen. Well, today I want to invite you to look at this painting with me. I imagine you can guess the artist. This is Vincent van Gogh's Old Man in Sorrow. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. It's when we celebrate the joy that Jesus brings into the world. And yet this year, for some of us, perhaps many years, we find ourselves feeling a bit more like this painting. And we start to think to ourselves, you know, I can't get into the Christmas spirit because I don't feel joyful. Or maybe this year, if that's not you, if you are feeling the merriment, then maybe it's someone you love. Sorrow at Christmas is something that is frustrating for us to feel inside ourselves and something that's hard to watch inside our loved ones. Hallmark movies make it look so easy, don't they? Bake some Christmas cookies, sing some carols, put some garland on the tree, pick out a special gift from the heart, and you'll go from Grinch to Saint Nick himself. But of course, in real life, it doesn't always work that way. In real life, it can be much harder to conjure up what others call Christmas joy. I'm going to say something a little bit radical here. At Christmas time each year, I see a lot of hurting people trying to distract themselves 
from their pain. Goodness knows even I have found myself doing this this year. We put our decorations up right after Halloween this year, telling each other we need a little extra Christmas this year. The tradition of the festival of light or a festival of light in the middle of winter during the shortest and the coldest days of the year, it's older and it's broader than our faith tradition. It's older than Jesus. So it's no wonder to me that people hold on to that festival of light, even as they might let go of the Jesus part. People have always looked for a way to self-medicate themselves out of their winter blues. And the lights and the decorations, the songs and the parties, they might do it for a bit until reality comes flooding back in full force. But here's the thing, and it's really key. When we say things like, I don't feel joyful, we're not actually talking about joy at all. One of the biggest lies we have been told, that even Microsoft Word was willing to tell me as I wrote this reflection, is that joy is a synonym for happiness. You see, what we really mean by the statement, I don't feel joyful, is that our lives have suffering and sorrow in them, or are anticipating suffering and sorrow. And we know that by definition, sorrow and suffering can't coexist with happiness, that they are direct opposites of happiness, a contradiction in terms. So if we're honest, if we step out of our denial and admit whatever grief we may be feeling, the way we might be suffering, then we must also admit our unhappiness, which feels in a way like conceding that Christmas hasn't or won't come for us this year. That the icing we tried to put on the canned Brussels sprouts, it didn't actually make them taste any better. And Christmas then becomes a chore of putting on a kind of fake smile, a fake happiness that feels inauthentic. Over time, we might even start to resent that thing that others call the joy of the season. And it's not that we want to bah humbug everyone who tries to wish us a Merry Christmas. It's just that we're still stuck at that prayer of longing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. The good news is that joy is not a synonym for happiness. And while others might spend the season chasing after that elusive happiness, trying to get high on lights and cookies and merriment, we have been invited by our faith to seek out something else, joy, something much deeper than happiness, something that is always there inside of us, even if it's lying dormant, even if it's been buried. Joy is like a bulb. It's there inside of us under all these layers of heaviness waiting to bloom. And like most of the riches, richest treasures of our faith, we find joy right at the crossroads of paradox. These two things that seemingly can't coexist, but which in the mystery of God do. We don't need to eliminate suffering and grief to find joy. Joy has no problem coexisting with our sorrow. Let me say that again. Joy has no problem coexisting with our sorrow. In fact, some might say that you can't reach joy by trying to detour your way around the suffering, but only by moving into it the way God does in the Christ child, this child who enters this world of pain 
and suffering. Today, many churches are focused on Mary, Jesus' mother, when she was pregnant with her first child, Jesus. And the focus is rightfully put there, for here's the truth that pregnant women know. To get to the new life that wants to emerge from within you, you have to go through pain and labor. The joy of bringing your child and all of your hopes for your child into the world will only be reached by facing your fears and moving through suffering. When I prepared to give birth for the first time, I remember that feeling of excited elation. I couldn't wait to meet my child. I had so many dreams and visions and hopes for my child and who they would be in the world and the way they would bless the world. Yet I also remember the fear of what the labor and the birth would be like, of knowing that before the child first would come pain. Many women don't speak super publicly about the anxiety that they experience going into their first birth. But privately, if you ask, sometimes they will share. Because for an expectant mother, joy and pain comes all intermingled together. Mary's world-famous speech, which many call the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. It's spoken from a place of that tension between joy and labor, joy and pain. She's about to go through what some call the most painful experience in life. And on top of that, she likely anticipates a major backlash from her family and her community as news spreads of a child conceived before she was wed. In fact, at this point in Luke's gospel, it's not clear whether Joseph will even stick by her. Her whole world could turn upside down because of her willingness to say yes to God. There will likely be some pain and suffering ahead. And yet, and yet, she still rejoices. She rejoices because she trusts that God is up to something, that the world is about to turn, even as she moves into and through this suffering. In Luke's gospel, this beautiful proclamation of hers, it isn't said in a vacuum. She's gone to visit, perhaps run away to, her cousin Elizabeth a companion who's going to walk three months of this pregnancy journey together with her. And it's no wonder to me that Mary's ex exclamation, this beautiful joy-filled vision of her life and her child's life, that it emerges as she spends time with a companion who so affirms her and so stands in solidarity with her another woman who was also preparing to give birth to her first child. Henry Nouwen writes, joy is hidden in compassion. He says the word compassion literally means to suffer with. It seems unlikely that suffering with another person would bring joy Yet being with a person in pain, offering our simple presence to someone in despair, sharing with a friend times of confusion and uncertainty, such experiences bring us deep joy. Not happiness, not excitement, not satisfaction, but the quiet joy of being there for someone else and living in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the human family. He continues, often this solidarity this is solidarity in weakness, in brokenness, and woundedness, but it leads to the center of joy, which is sharing our humanity with others. True joy is most felt in our shared vulnerability and when we feel that deep compassion for one another. 
It comes as we walk beside and seek to be with those who are suffering. Nalan's words, I think, are profound. Mary speaks in solidarity with all those who suffer, with all those who feel powerless, bullied, weighed down. She speaks of these grand reversals that feel a bit too much like fantasy for those of us who've become jaded after being worn down by the grit of the world. Really, Mary? God's going to pull the tyrants from their thrones? I wish. Really? God is going to fill the hungry and send the rich away empty? I wish. Are you really in touch with reality, Mary? But those of us who have moved through suffering, through suffering into new life, we know that such reversals and such transformations are possible. We know because of our suffering, not in spite of it. Mary finds joy and purpose in her pregnancy by framing it as participation in God's great action of compassion for the world. I wonder what we could learn from her this season. We began watching Disney's most recent major motion production of Charles Dickens' classic, Scrooge, this weekend, which turned out to be much darker than we had anticipated, a little too dark for kids. But in the opening scene, after Ba humbugging his employee, after Ba humbugging the Child Welfare Board seeking his charity, Ba humbugging his nephew, even a group of carolers on the corner, Scrooge walks through town to his house. As my six-year-old watched this scene of him entering this towering shadowy gate of his home, she asked me, is that prison? Of course it wasn't, it was his home. And yet what she asked had some merit. Charles Dickens Scrooge character is someone who has locked himself in a sort of prison. And it isn't just because of greed or a misplaced belief that money will buy happiness. It isn't just because he refuses to be merry or is honest about his grief and unhappiness. It's because he hasn't yet found his way into the joy that is hidden in compassion. Our circumstances might lock us in prisons, but it is the walling up and the locking off of our hearts that really imprisons us. So this year, I wonder how and where you will follow compassion into solidarity. Joy won't come easy this year for a great many people in our world. But allowing the Christ child to remind us of our shared humanity and resolutely each of us deciding to participate in God's compassion in the world. Well, that might very well bring the joy that feels so hard to come by. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's take a moment of silence to digest. Well, why don't we come back together? My wonder question for us today is, I wonder if you have experienced the joy hidden in compassion, the joy of solidarity. If you've experienced that this year or any year and what that has looked like for you. If you'd like to share, just unmute yourself and remember to mute yourself again when you're done. Has anyone experienced the joy hidden in compassion? I have. Um, when I worked for hospice for six and a half years, having compassion and dealing with the patients and their families, and sometimes just being the ear to 
let the patients or the or the uh, family feel the the rage or the anger that their loved one is sick or that they are sick. Um, I was never happier in a job than I was for those six and a half years. Thank you, Donna. Yeah, and, and maybe what you found was was beyond happiness, um, even deep yes. down into joy. Yes. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. I have an experience that happened to me years ago when I was in college. The, the, the experience of joy and compassion has focused many, many times, but this one I particularly remember. Uh, I was teaching Bible school, um, and the children that uh, we were teaching, I decided they were little boys, and they had lived out in the desert in Nevada, that we would go camping. And so I took them to Lake Mead, and uh, you know, I bought food for us. I bought potato chips and hot dogs and all these salty things, and uh, one bottle of soda pop per person. And so by the time we got out there <laughs> and had finished our meal, I was just thirsty as I could be. I was hungry. We were out in the, <clears throat> we, we had sleeping bags and we were sleeping, it was dark by this time. And I was thinking, oh, this thing has been so miserable, you know. Uh, this one little boy reached over and he took my hand and he said, Mr. Roy, he says, this is the happiest moment of my life. Hmm. Wow, you know, what I thought was tragedy was a great experience for him and it became one for me. Thank you, Roy. I had one semester in seminary when I can't remember why, but I wasn't going home for Thanksgiving, probably because Christmas break was coming up so soon after. And I was all the way on the other side of the country. Um, but I had been taking uh, a class, um, Islam in America that semester. And, and it was kind of co-taught by the seminary and Princeton University. And uh, I was invited by a group of Muslim students to go with them and serve a meal that day, um, kind of traditional um, food of their culture and tradition. And, and so I went with this group of students down to the food bank and we, we served together. Um, and there's something about um, doing that on the holidays when I was used to just um, <laughs> consuming food and cooking with my family and enjoying our own time. Um, but something about that felt like I was just in the right place. And I had these beautiful conversations um, about Jesus actually with a number of these Muslim students. Um, many of you know, the Quran is full of, of a lot about Jesus. Um, and, and they were teaching me and sharing with me about Jesus in that moment uh, as we served together and um, as all these, these folks came walking in off the street needing a, a meal. Um, and that was just a beautiful, very joyful holiday for me. Are there others who'd like to share about an experience of finding joy and compassion? I, I think I would. It's... It's a paradox, um, but volunteering as a guardian ad litem, and I know there are at least three others on this in our congregation. I think there are probably some who have been guardians. But that joy of knowing that we directly make a difference in a child's life um, who are in desperate situations brings me immense, um, I've often said it is the most fulfilling and joyful and the most tragic and frustrating thing that I do. But the joy underneath is what keeps me going. Thank you, Jean. And I've heard that from all of you who are guardians, that mix of things that coexist in you as you do this um, really important work. Are there any others who would like to share? Um, oh, am I unmuted? This is Noel. Okay. Yesterday was the most amazing thing. Joel usually sleeps till 12, till noon, and then we have to drag him up. Yesterday morning, he had a dream he could not get out of this dream. 
But in this dream, we were coming back to Long Island on the ferry from Connecticut. From We come down from Maine and then take a ferry over to the east end of Long Island. From uh, So he says, oh, the first thing he said was, oh, thank you for coming on this trip with me. I said, oh, I'm delighted to. Uh, it was fun. How did you like it? Uh, not very much. But anyway, he said, we got to get, get off this ferry before it gets back to Connecticut. I got to get up. I got to come on. Let's get out of here. So for half an hour, we're get. this is at eight o'clock in the morning. So we're getting dressed. We're going out to the front room where he can reorient to Florida. And uh, well, he wanted to go outside. So we went out and sat on the porch. I said, look, it's a miracle. They brought us all the way home to Florida. <laughs> and, and what should he says? Well, well, where shall we go? We we got to go in the car, don't we? Okay, so we went out, and he still had on his pajama bottom, so we couldn't go to a real room. But we did take out and had breakfast in a park overlooking the boats, and it was the most amazing and joyful and satisfying thing that I said look this is what morning looks like in St. Petersburg <laughs> uh, and I just I mean we came back and he went back to bed until five o'clock but it it was the it was the most hilarious and precious time to mm -hmm. spend together <laughs> thank you thank you you know just being being with each other being, being together mm -hmm. yeah and just going wherever life takes us today on <laughs> whatever boat or ferry or whatever. Thank you so much for sharing, Noel. Are there any others you'd like to share? Well, friends, I would like to invite you uh, to continue in your giving uh, beyond uh, being with each other in solidarity as a form of compassion Joining ourselves into God's mission statement in the world with all of our resources is, is part of we, how we find uh, joy in this season and in all seasons. And, and so I invite you to continue to give out of what God has given to you, um, that it might be used in our work of building the beloved community together with God here in our community. Uh, you can mail in checks. You can bring them by the food pantry during pantry hours, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, 9 to noon. Or you can go to discovergoodsam.org slash give and make uh, a gift there. And now, friends, on this third Sunday of Advent, go out in peace. Go out in joy. May you find in your life, even uh, in the midst of pain and suffering, may you find that deep well of joy that comes from God's solidarity with us and our solidarity with one another. Go in peace. And now let us sing our closing song. And a big thank you to the UCC for providing some of our music uh, to us this morning. Will you all unmute your mics and we'll shout out together, Shalom, Salam, Peace. Are you ready? Ready. Here we go. Shalom. 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 Peace. 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 Go in peace, my friends.